right, well, you can open your Bibles with us to Hebrews chapter 13. We began looking at this passage last week and didn't quite make it all the way through, so we're going to finish it up this morning. Let me read the passage for us. And then we'll start, uh, we'll talk about it. Hebrews 13, verse number 1 says, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? Contentment is really what we said is the underlying uh, connection between the commands that are given to us in these passages. Contentment. Let brotherly love continue and, and reach out to those who are afflicted and show kindness and hospitality to strangers and uh, all of these commands, how do we do this if we're not content, right? But those things that we covered last week, those are, I mean, they push us a little bit, right? But they don't make us weird, right? For lack of a better term. Because the reality is you could bring just about anybody into this room last week and they could have listened to the message and went, yeah, we should be nice to people, right? We would have gotten a lot of pat on the backs. Pats on the backs. <laughs> Subject, you know, it's never been my strong suit, English, whatever it is. But the passages we come to this morning... Make us sound more than a little weird. I was going to be honest, right up front, right? You ever been in one of those situations where you stand out, you know you stand out, and it's super awkward? Ever been in that kind of situation? I was thinking about this, and I remember a situation uh, when I was in, oh goodness, I was probably, I was probably, a, I might have been a freshman in high school, middle school, and I, I made, it might have actually been my eighth grade year, I made the soccer team. Now, as an underclassman, when you make the soccer team, you got seniors and juniors and all this on here. As an underclassman, the one thing you want to do more than anything else is not stick out, right? You just want to kind of blend in, do what everybody else does, look like everybody else, and just kind of make it, right? When you make a soccer team, you need a pair of cleats. My mom, who's listening this morning, knows I love her. She bought me a nice, brand new, shiny pair of white cleats. Listen, that doesn't sound like a big deal, right? It doesn't. White's fine, right? I got nothing against white shoes, white cleats. But I was the only person on the entire soccer team with white cleats. So I earned a nickname. It was a, I was Chief White Running Shoes. <laughs> and I stood out. And I felt like it now. It probably was a bigger deal to me than it was to anybody else. Like I felt like every time I stepped on a soccer field, I was like, I can't wait till these things break, man. Like I'm going around kicking dirt, kicking grass, just hoping they tear up a little bit faster. 
We don't, we don't really like to be put on the spot, right? We don't like to stand out for something that most people think is uniquely different or weird in some way. And yet, these couple of verses that we're coming to today, that's exactly what they do, right? It's going to get a little bit weird. It's going to get a little bit uncomfortable. But it is God's word nonetheless. So what's so weird about it? Two things. The first one is found in verse number four. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. In other words, God is saying, we are giving a command here to run from immorality. To, if we were to put it in the positive sense, to be content with God's design for marriage and sex. I came across this quote that I think is attributed, Tim Keller is where I found the quote. I think he's referring back to a quote from Augustine uh, in his book, The City of God. I just couldn't pull the quote. I couldn't find it directly from him. But he says this, the early church was strikingly different from the culture around it in this way. The pagan society was stingy with its money and promiscuous with its body. A pagan gave nobody their money and practically gave everybody their body. And the Christians came along and gave practically nobody their body and gave practically everybody their money. Right? Love the stranger. Show hospitality to the stranger. But you keep your body. That's a countercultural notion. It was in Paul's day, it was in Augustine's day, it is in our day. It makes us different. Now, we're not really sure the exact reason why the author puts this command here, other than it is God's word, it is something we're to follow. But we do know this. There were, in, in the day that this book was written, uh, the book of Hebrews, there were two very serious errors about or concerning marriage. One of those was this group of people that said there should be absolute celibacy whether you're married or not. That, that marriage in some way defiles you and so you should just stay away from, from any physical intimacy even with your spouse. And if you think that notion died in the first century, you're wrong. It existed. I, my wife, I'll never forget, she came across the, a quote from a book that was written by a pastor's wife, probably uh, 1800s, late 1800s, a pastor's wife. And the encouragement from this pastor's wife to all the other wives reading this book was that you, wife, need to wean your husband from any physical desire. And so that by the time you reach like your 40s, you've got, him, you've got it done, man. It's, it's over with. And her purpose was holiness, of course. There's this notion that somehow we are defiled. That was one of the, the misconceptions or errors that was floating around uh, in the first century church. And so Paul actually approaches this. Paul mentions it a couple times. First Timothy chapter 4, he writes and says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and by prayer. Now, I included an extended portion of that passage because there is this warning, this general warning in that passage against all who would add to God's law and require others to do the same, right? 
We, we kind of we bring in this idea of conscience. If you want to study this out further, I would encourage you to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and Romans 14, where it's talking about your conscience and the role that it plays. And, and what do we do with our conscience? If I disagree with somebody in a matter that is not explicitly written out in Scripture, what do we do about that? Well, I am to defer to your conscience. You must obey your conscience. I must obey your con- my conscience. And I cannot impose my conscience on you. That's wrong. But this issue of celibacy in marriage is not a matter of conscience. Paul clarifies, gets a little bit more detailed in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 when he says, Do not deprive one another, speaking to husbands and wives, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. It's not a defilement, okay? It is good, it is right, but it is limited in that God puts a boundary around it and says only in marriage, which brings us to the second problem. you got one ditch on one side saying complete celibacy at all times, both inside and outside of marriage, and on the other side of things, you had people that didn't care whether you were married or not. They were more falling into the category of the people that Augustine described in the quote that I read to you uh, just a few minutes ago, that they just give their bodies to anybody and everybody, and it doesn't matter. we got errors on both sides of the ditch, and into those two errors, the author of Hebrews really speaks to both of them here. Marriage is honorable and is to be honored. It is good. It is right. But sex is for marriage only. It is limited. It is bound. And what he's asking of us in this passage is that we understand God's design for these two things and be content. Be content with God's design. If God has designed them, then he has the right to define them. He has the right to put boundaries around them again makes this wildly unpopular because it actually uh, strikes back against the attacks that have been made against marriage and the place and the value of sex in our lives and in our culture. If you don't think this is weird yet, hang on, okay? But if you don't think this is weird yet, then you need to take this passage to a a non-Christian environment and try teaching it. I've had that experience. It's really weird. I mean, I've been doing this for a fairly long time, and it felt really weird. I felt really weird. And I'm not alone in that feeling. I read from, uh, from John MacArthur this week. He had an opportunity to go. He was invited by a local university to teach on uh, Christian ethics, and they wanted him to specifically address Uh, sexual ethics in Christianity, and he's like, I'm going to a group of completely non-Christian college students, and they're going to think I am off the wall, man. They're going to think I am completely out there, and so I love what he did. He actually started the conversation by, you're going to think I'm really weird, and there's nothing you can do about it, (laughs) right? Because everything I'm about to tell you requires trust in the Lord. It requires that. If we're going to cling to these things and hold fast to these things and obey these things, we must be contented with our relationship with Christ. Because if we're looking for our contentment from other people, we ain't going to get it here. Okay? We're not going to get a whole lot of agreement with us. So let's just let's unpack this just a little bit. He tells us that marriage should be held in honor. What does that mean? Well, it does not mean that everybody has to do it, okay? Can we just put that out there? This does not mean that everybody needs to be married or pursue marriage. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am single. Paul's like, if you're not married... Great, right? Now, again, he's not saying marriage is bad, 
But what he's saying is, and he explains himself a little while later in the passage, he says, if you're not married, you are free to serve Christ in a way that a married individual is not free. Right? Because married people are bound to their spouse. We're concerned about the things of this life because we have given ourselves to someone else in this life. But someone who's not married, you're just free to serve the Lord in whatever way that, uh, that whatever opportunity happens to arise. You have a freedom of resources and a freedom of time, generally speaking, that those who are married do not, right? So he's not saying that everybody needs to pursue this. Everybody must get married. That's not the point. He says we are to honor it. That word honor is interesting. It comes up a, a number of times in the New Testament, and, and a handful of times it's actually translated as precious. One example of this, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, Peter says we are bought with precious blood, the blood of Christ Jesus. In other words, we are to view marriage as something precious. It is a gift that God has supplied to us as, uh, as joy, as something to be enjoyed. Now, how do we honor it then? We can't honor it if we don't know what it is, right? So let's very quickly just, just entertain a definition of marriage that I think is consistent with, with how God lays it out in the Scripture. Here's the definition. Marriage is a lifelong covenant between a man and woman that unifies that man and woman both physically and spiritually. Let me say it again, because every aspect of this is here for a reason, and it's very intentional. It is a lifelong covenant between a man and a woman that unifies that man and woman both physically and spiritually. And we see this all the way back in Genesis chapter 2 when God creates uh, man. He says to the man, or he, he puts Adam to sleep. He takes a rib from Adam. He creates woman from that rib. And again, man, you want to feel weird Right, lay that out to some non-Christian people. They're going to look at you a little bit funny and go, nah, man, this whole thing just blew up and exploded and here we are, right? I'm not sure that requires any less faith. Um, but in chapter 2, verse 23, Adam, being presented Eve, says the, uh, he, uh, the man said this, uh, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, right? Covenantal unity of a man and woman. Jesus picks up on this notion in Matthew chapter 19, and he repeats it. Have you not read that you created them from the beginning, made them male and female, and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What well, therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus emphasizing here the enduring quality of this unifying covenant. It is God's idea, God has defined it, and God has set the boundaries for it. Paul picks up in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband Paul picks up and says that there is a testimony that comes along with the enduring unity between a man and a woman. That God in some way has crafted the unity of marriage to demonstrate the love that Christ has for His people, the sacrificial love of Jesus for His church. And the respect and love that the church has in return for Christ, marriage is to imitate and demonstrate the gospel. So how then do we honor it? 
We have to understand what it is. And I would just say, coming out of that notion, two things real quick. Number one, if you're not cultivating the relationship, husband, wife, then you're kind of missing the point, right? Because if our relationship together is to be a demonstration of the love of Christ for his church and the relationship that the church shares with Christ, if we are not cultivating the relationship with our wives or wives with your husbands, then, then I'm not sure we're fulfilling that to its fullest intent. If we're just kind of existing in the same house, two ships passing in the night, uh, enjoying the mutual benefits that society offers to those who are married, then you're kind of missing the point. We are to honor marriage, and I think we have to give the husband-wife relationship its due. We have to give it time. We have to give it energy. We have to give it creativity. Guys, put effort into your marriage. Second thing I would say quickly is, is if God allows, have kids. Right? Because that's one of the purposes for marriage is to have kids. And Psalm 127 says that kids are, that they're a heritage, man. It, it's an honor. It's a blessing. I read a statement from Kevin DeYoung uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he was writing about the, our current cultural war, and, and he just wrote and said, hey, how about a new strategy to winning the cultural war? Because trying to take over the government didn't really work so well, right? Uh, back in the 80s, you got the big Christian push, and uh, we, we've seen the uh, kind of the kickback from that. He's like, well, how about a different strategy? How about we just have more kids than everybody else? And how about we just raise up a generation of children who love the Lord, who see Christ modeled in their home, and we just outbirth the unbelievers? How about that for a cultural shift? I told you it was going to get awkward, right? Everyone's looking around now. That's how we honor marriage. We honor marriage by holding to the definition as God has defined it, which means to redefine marriage is a dishonor of marriage. To redefine marriage to include same-sex unions or any other sexual relationships between uh, Anyone else besides man and woman is a redefinition fundamentally of how God has defined it. And this sounds really out of touch, doesn't it? But the reality is you might take a square and call it a circle, doesn't make it a circle, right? You can take a same-sex relationship and call it marriage, but it doesn't make it so. We can issue certificates. We can have ceremonies. We can even have two people that love each other very much. But it doesn't make it so. Redefining marriage and in some ways, how arrogant are we to take a God-given, God-designed, God-defined institution and think that with a wave of our legislative, legislative hand, we can just change the unalterable decrees of Almighty God? What arrogance. And I'm going to sound even more out of touch when I say, listen, and, and, and I please want you to understand me here, we'll, we'll, but it doesn't matter whether someone was born a certain way or not. That question gets brought up all the time, and I'm submitting to you folks, it's irrelevant. If science tomorrow proves that there is some genetic predisposition towards homosexuality, it does not alter this one bit. Because the reality is we were all born a certain way, weren't we? I was born an egomaniac. Okay? And again, my mom is watching. Those of you who are online right now, text her and ask, right? 
I was an egomaniac. I thought the world revolved around me. I wanted what I wanted when I wanted it. And I didn't think that anybody had the right to tell me no or wait or anything else. And if you did, I was going to let you know about it for a very long time. Yeah. The reality is, folks, we were born liars. We were born thieves. No one had to teach you how to lie, right? I mean, come on. You didn't have to see that modeled. It just, just comes out of us. No one had to teach you how to cheat. No one had to teach you how to desire something that someone else has and want it so badly that you try to sneak it away. No one had to teach you that. A friend of mine was telling me that her daughter uh, took something, I don't remember what it was now, but she was in school and, and decided there was something that she wanted. And, and so her, her daughter, who's just an elementary student on the younger side, like, like I'm talking like second or third grade, took this item, lifted up the sole of her shoe, the little insert, slid it inside the sole, and walked out with it. She's like, what? where does that come from? Who's teaching her these things? And the reality is we don't have to be taught. We're born in such a way. We were born with a nature that hated God. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse number 9, Paul says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Who are the unrighteous? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. I mean, he just read a laundry list of items, and he's like, guess what, church? That used to be you, didn't it? You used to be there. Folks, the reality is we don't get to redefine what God has defined. And if we are to honor marriage as God is asking us to hold it precious, we cannot redefine it. And it's going to be awkward, and it's going to be weird. But you know what? These kinds of conversations have always been awkward and weird throughout the history of Christianity. I mean, for goodness sakes, man, John the Baptist got thrown in prison and ultimately beheaded because he spoke against the open marriage between Herod and Herodias, his, his, his wife, right, that was actually uh, belonged to someone else. John the Baptist is like, you can't do that. Herod's like, watch me. Speaking the truth of, of, of God into this arena is not popular, and it gets less so when he describes in verse number four and says, let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. You see, folks, this is really important because God's design for marriage includes our purity. It includes our morality. God is intensely interested in your sexual purity. He describes two groups here, the sexually immoral and the adulterous, and really what he's doing is just covering the gambit here. Whether you are married or you are not married, God is intensely interested in your purity in this matter. And man, this is just outrageously countercultural, isn't it? I mean, for the, you know, we talk about when we talk about same-sex marriage, we're talking about something that's relatively recent in our society. When we talk about this, our purity, saving ourselves for a husband or wife, you talk about that, we're going back to like the '60s, man. We're going back generations of this being ingrained into the psyche of our culture. To where now when you even just read this passage in the non-Christian environment, it feels strange. And, and even in some, I would argue this, even in some uh, nominally Christian environments, you're going to get some really strange looks. Right? Because they're going to be like, what do you mean? I can't, we, we can't like test each other out first to make sure we're going to be satisfied in our marriage? Like that just doesn't make any sense at all. How will we know if we're going to be happy? 
right? It's completely foreign. These words from God are unalterable, though. We have taken something that God has specifically designed for our good, and we have turned it into the very meaning of our existence. Right? I mean, this, this is what's going on in our culture today. Today, you are defined by your sexual interest. That defines who you are. And if it defines who I am, then you have no right to curb my behavior. You have no right to tell me otherwise. We have taken something good and we've turned it into a God. And gods that we manufacture are never satisfied. They only and always demand more. And the result of such thinking has been the radicalization and weaponization of sexually perverse ideologies. I mean, honestly, folks, it's not even safe to, in some encounters, when you bring this sort of thing up from people, you can't even have a conversation. Because we immediately jump to the, well, why do you hate me? It's not, I don't hate you. <laughs> it has nothing to do with hating you. But when you identify by that thing, it's, it feels like an attack against who you are. It feels like a personal assault. Sam Storm said this, he says, telling others that God hates their sin and that God will judge them for their sin is the second most loving thing you could ever tell them. And it is the second most only because the most loving thing you can tell them is that Jesus has come to cleanse them from their sins. It's not hateful to tell someone that God hates sin and that God judges sin. 1 Corinthians, again, chapter 6, Paul's like, these people who continually, unrepentantly do these things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And these conversations are awkward and they are hard and most of the time we just want to avoid them at all costs. But listen to me, folks. If we genuinely, genuinely love someone and we see them standing on the precipice of eternal disaster, isn't it worth a few minutes of an awkward conversation to say, hey, you know what? Man, God doesn't approve. And listen, I understand, we gotta be careful here, right? Because we might be talking about family members and maybe we've had this conversation and, and maybe it's like, all right, we gotta take things slow, okay? We gotta play the long game with some people. Please do, be wise. I'm not asking you to take your Bible and just bludgeon people to death with it. That doesn't, that doesn't work, by the way. You want to turn people off real quickly, do that. Right? That's, how, that's how the Islamic faith grows. We just, we just pound people to death. That's not what we do. God must change our heart or else none of this is going to make sense. So we present the truth. We present the truth in love. And sometimes that means patience. But it also means that we can't put it off forever. And we can't just never have the conversation. It also means that we can't stand on our high horse and be judgmental. Right? Because Paul says, guess what? <laughs> you were there. You were there. Paul's like, but by the grace of God, I would still be there. But by the grace of God, we would all be there. I got no right to stand in judgment over someone who's bound up by their sin, who is enslaved by their own heart's desires. Because except for the grace of God in my life, I would be right there with them. Helpless. That's just to make sure you got that point. Last thing I would say here is that being saved and washed, cleansed, doesn't mean that all the wrong desires will go away, and especially not right away, right? 
there are plenty of believers who still struggle with things like same-sex attraction, just as there are many believers who still struggle with lust after women and greed and on and on and on. It doesn't mean all the temptations are going to go away. And it doesn't mean that if you struggle with the temptation, you fall into the category of not inheriting the kingdom of God. Because there's good news attached to this. That Jesus Christ came to save us from our sinfulness. Holiday, can I just say this to us as a church? We need to be a place where it is safe to be a sinner. Now, I've said this before. If there's any place where it needs to be safe for sinners to be sinners, it needs to be here. Which means being critical and judgmental or standoffish. It just has no place here. Because we are the only place, the church of the living God, who is the buttress and the support for the truth of God, is the only safe place for sinners to run. And if we close our doors and we close our eyes and we close our arms to them, where else are they going to go? What do we do in such a culture? The temptations are pervasive. It's everywhere. First Corinthians 6 says, flee sexual immorality. Run from it. Don't dabble in it. Don't see how close you can get. Don't see how far you can go. Run. Someone said to me once, I was part of a little homework assignment and said, you know, what do, what do you think about this running idea? And I was like, well, I, I don't think it's a good approach. It sounds like I'm a coward. It sounds like I'm weak. I should be able to stand against the temptation. <laughs> like, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls, right? But don't call it weak. God is like, run. Run for your life. Don't mess around. We run from immorality. And secondly, we run from materialism. He says in the final verses here, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Be content, right? The key to consistent sacrificial love, the key to sexual purity and marital fidelity is Contentment, the key from keeping myself free from the love of money and the materialism that would grip my heart is to find my contentment ultimately in my relationship with Christ. And by the way, it is the love of money that is the problem here. It is not money. Or that might feel like it puts us on a razor's edge here, like we're, we're walking you know, across the blade of a knife and, and there's very little room for error on either side because if it's the love of money on the one hand and, and money can tempt us on the other hand and, and we know how easily we're tempted and we just, we just find this, this ground sometimes difficult to traverse. But I want us to understand there's nothing wrong with wealth. There's nothing wrong with someone who has money. 1 Timothy chapter 6, listen to what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, he's warning him against false teachers, and he calls them, he says, those, they, those are they who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain, which just sounds a whole lot like prosperity gospel preachers, doesn't it? Not in it for the glory of Christ, not in it for the salvation of souls, not in it for the encouragement or the equipping of God's people, but in it because they think they can gain material wealth from it. Paul called them false teachers. Beware. But he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. And I want you to notice the middle ground here, okay? Because Paul's saying you should not desire wealth because it doesn't do you any good, right? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Not how much you own in this life. Not how fat your bank account is. 
that leads to all kinds of evils, right? But on the other hand, he's not glorifying abject poverty either. He's like, be content with what you need by having what you need. He says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Here's how serious it is. It is through this craving, he says, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, Flee these things. Here's the same exact advice that he gives to the temptation towards sexual immorality. Run. Run from it. Don't dabble in it. Proverbs 30, I wanted to read this to us as well. Proverbs 30 verse 7 says, Two things I ask of you. Prayer to God. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Number one, remove far from me falsehood and lying. Okay? Let me be honest, tell the truth. Number two, give me neither poverty nor riches. That's an interesting prayer request, isn't it? I mean, how, how many times in our prayer life are we just, do we just find ourselves asking God for more and more and more because maybe deep down inside we are struggling with a desire for riches. And your definition of riches versus Bill Gates' definition of riches might be light years apart from each other, but it doesn't mean it's not the same root desire. Here the psalmist is like, give me neither poverty nor riches. And he explains why. Feed me with the food that is needful for me unless I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? In other words, if you give me too much, I can sit back in my comfort and go, I got everything I need. Who needs God, right? I got what I needed. I'm good. He's like, no, there's danger in that. I don't want too much. But there's also a danger in poverty. He says, Who, uh, or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. In other words, just meet my needs, God, so that I'm not tempted to steal what does not belong to me and so that I'm not tempted to forget you and the fact that I need you every day. Every hour, I need you. And folks, how easily can we grow discontent in these two areas? Maybe there's some discontent in your heart right now. Maybe it's with your spouse. Maybe it's with your singleness. Maybe it's with God's design for your purity or with your job or with your ability to make money or with the amount of money that your parents have kids, right? Because, because as a kid, what do we want? We want our parents to have lots of money so we can have lots of stuff, right? We need better games, better toys, better clothes. And the world is constantly appealing to your flesh to make you discontent constantly showing you bigger and better things, tempting you to buy and even to live outside of your means in order to have what you want. And then we just rack up debt, we just spend money we don't even have in order to get that which we do not need. We simply want it. And it happens so fast, doesn't it? I mean, you get a phone and like next week the new version is out. It's like, oh, it's got 18 cameras. I gotta have it. There's always something bigger and better. And so often, I feel like we end up like King Ahab. You remember this character? King Ahab shows up in 1 Kings. He was not a good king. Had more than one confrontations with Elijah. More than he would care to remember. There's one occasion in 1 Kings 21 where Ahab is out walking and he sees a field that's near his palace. It's a vineyard. He's like, I want it, got to have it. Well, the problem was this was a field that was an inheritance that had been passed down to the man Naboth. And so he goes to Naboth and he says, I need your field. I'll pay you for it. I'll even give you another field. And Naboth says no. But the reason Naboth says no is because God told him to say no. Because according to the law of God, you could not give away or sell the inheritance land that was yours by birthright, right? 
You, you couldn't do it. It was yours, and it had to stay in your family. And so Nabal was like, I can't do it. I mean, I kind of thought maybe Ahab, you can kind of get the idea that maybe Ahab see it, it was a beautiful vineyard, and he's like, oh, man, I need that vineyard because I want to put up a hammock, right? I want to sit in a hammock and watch the sunset, sip some wine from my own vineyard with my nice wife here, Jezebel, right? And it would just be a great time sitting in my vineyard and chilling out, but that's not what he wanted at all. You know what he wanted to do? He wanted to turn it into a vegetable garden. We're like, I'm out now. Like, like I could kind of understand, but then you went all like eggplant and, and uh, I don't know, tomatoes, and I'm out. Uh, you lost me. I don't, I don't even understand you anymore. But when he's told no, you know how he responds? He goes back to his house, and he sits on his bed, and he's angry, and he's frustrated, and he pouts. He refuses to eat. And Jezebel comes in and is like, what is wrong with you? You're the king. If you want it, I'll get it for you. And so she devises a plan, has Naboth killed, and suddenly the vineyard belongs to Ahab. And Ahab is happy again. Such a weird thing, right? Like what kind of adult pouts like this because they couldn't get their way? I was just like, man, that's so strange. And But then you... Maybe you noticed that it was Ahab's wife that came in and she, she fixed the situation for him. And, and all that reminds you of is the fact that you're alone. Ahab had a wife and she came in to help him and, and I don't and I'm alone. And so you, you turn on Netflix and you grab a pint of ice cream and you binge eat while you binge watch, right? You just kind of have a little pity party. Because we're not content. Or you find out you didn't get the raise that you really felt you deserved. Or you just really want a house more like your friends. Or a, co a car more like your coworkers, Or a spouse more like your neighbors. But whatever the thing is in your heart right now that is creating that discontent. It is pulling you away. It is telling you that you must have it in order to be happy. But the antidote to our discontent is what? It is relationship with God himself. The way that we find contentment is knowing that God is our helper. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He is our helper. And if you're not convinced of that, then you will always question why bad things happened to you when you thought you were doing pretty good. Or why you can't have what others have. But to know that God is with you and that he helps you, then you can say with the psalmist and with the author of Hebrews, I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can he do? You cannot take my relationship with Christ. Therefore, you cannot touch my contentment. And you cannot steal my joy. See why I say this is the foundation for all of these four commands? Because if you have this kind of contentment, you are rock solid. If you don't have it, then it's not a bunch of to-do list things that you need to run out of here and tick off your checklist and sell everything that you have and give it all to the poor. No, it's not about that. Although it might be. But what it is about is you being convinced Knowing, experiencing that God is all that we need. Let's pray. Father, help us with this. We struggle here to believe that you are all that we need. And sometimes you put a finger on our desires, and sometimes the circumstances of life expose these other things that we feel we must have in order to be happy. Lord, sometimes it's as simple as the air condition going out and realizing just how dependent on things we truly are for our happiness. But God, we pray for your people this morning that you would cause us to be contented in you. That we might find great joy and contentment in your design for our marriages or for our singleness 
that we might find great joy and contentment with what we have, the possessions that you have graciously given to us to enjoy in this life. Lord, because they are from you, help us to hold them lightly. Help us to be willing to give to everyone from what we have, but give to no one the bodies that you have created for us. Lord, help us to be a unique people. You've called us to be holy as you are holy. Lord, with verses like these, there is nowhere to hide. They run completely against the grain of common thinking. It makes us sound weird. It even makes us sound hateful and angry, but God, it is out of love for you and it is out of love for the lost that we hold fast. And it is for our own joy that we strive to obey. Grant us help. Lord, if there is someone in the sound of my voice this morning, if there's someone listening online, someone in this room who does not know this kind of contentment or joy in Christ, they're just bound up by their sin, I pray you would free them. I pray that the gospel of Christ would cleanse them from all their unrighteousness. Grant them faith in Christ alone. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.